Well, good evening. Welcome. I am Pastor Rick Williams, and you're at Zion Lutheran Church in beautiful Ashland, Wisconsin. Gorgeous day out there today. I, I think, actually. I haven't been out since this morning. But sun's shining, and I don't hear the wind whistling, so hopefully things are going well. Um, it is Wednesday, August 25th. Okay, I think I may have written it wrong, but... Uh, yeah, August 25th, Wednesday, it is our evening prayer, and tonight we are going to be looking at our readings from this past Sunday, which I believe was the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Um, our Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah 29, verses 11 to 19. Um, epistle comes from Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. Um, a verse that's sometimes used uh, at weddings. Um, we'll look at that. And then our gospel reading, Mark 7, 1 to 13, where uh, Jesus talks about how the uh, scribes and the Pharisees make all these rules that really have nothing to do with the worship of God and, and become works. And, uh, and basically he says that they honor them with his lips, but not their hearts so we're going to take a look at that and uh, actually what I'm going to be doing tonight we'll, we will take a brief look at the uh, Old Testament and the epistle but then I'm going to redo the uh, sermon from Sunday uh, we had some audio issues on Sunday uh, those were um, self-generated I uh, forgot to turn on the microphone uh, so it was only picking up through the sanctuary mic, which didn't do a very good job. So in case you missed it, uh, hopefully you'll watch it tonight and catch it. Um, so yeah, so that's the plan. Um, let me see what else we have. Uh, there's not many announcements. Um, here's the big couple. Wednesday evening services are going to continue online. I originally was going to start uh, second week in September, but then realized I'm going to be gone uh, the fourth week in September and I'm going to be gone the first week in October. Uh, fourth week in September for the pastors conference down in Wausau and then in October I'm actually going on a, a short little vacation and I'll be gone. So rather than have it for a week or two and then not have it for a couple weeks and then try and get back into it, um, we're just going to wait and uh, start probably the second week in October. Let me look at my calendar. Yeah, I'm guessing the 13th of October will be our first in-person um, church service. I'm still thinking about uh, trying to get enough people together to do a potluck for that uh, Sunday after Labor Day, the 12th. Um, if you have any interest at all in that, let me know. Shoot me an email, send me a text. Call the church. Uh, let me know what you think. Um, if we don't get enough people, well, then we'll put it off till later. I just thought it might be nice as we're getting back and getting ready to try and start up Sunday school and Bible study and all of that. It would be a good time to uh, get together and share a meal. So anyway, uh, that's that. Um, let me get, I'm going to switch over to the prayer list this evening. And I did write the 26th. It's the 25th, not the 26th. On our prayer list, Colton Ladine, Walt Schutte, Haley Fisher, Judith Wismuth, Danny Posternet, Sherry Gursky, Rosemary Mano, Harold Larson, Sally Gustafson, Lisa Thompson, Russell Joyner, Carmela Cortakis, and Tyler Hildebrand. If anybody has any updates on any of those, let me know. Um, I've been following up with some of them. I know Judith is home. And I know that Harold is still having some testing done, and, and but I think he's doing a little better. Uh, I know Sally's doing better, so hopefully we can get her off the list pretty quick. Her surgery went well. And uh, I haven't heard an update on Tyler. I'm going to try and chase that down this week and see how he's doing. So anyway, so if you know anything, let me know. So we'll go back to me. There. How's that? Um, boy, that's a shiny spot on the top of my head. I, I need a shade or a hat or something. Lighting is not good. Um, yeah, and, and let's see, what's the week, 25th? Uh, two more weeks, and, and then this whole office is going to get rearranged that week of Labor Day. We're going to uh, 
do a little office redecorating, remodeling, cleaning, cleaning out, and uh, that'll be interesting. You'll be able to see that in the background, I think, once we do it. So, with that being said, I guess we will get ready. Um, our verse of the day today comes from uh, our epistle reading. It comes from uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and uh, here it is. Let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. It's all part of that love and respect, how husband and wife should love each other the same way that Christ loves the church. So, uh, yeah, so that's our, our special verse for tonight. <clears throat> With that, I think then we're ready to start. I'm just taking a quick look. Yeah, I think that'll do it. So, we begin always in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and illumine your church. O joyous light of glory, the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ, that his word may be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful, and you love your whole creation, and we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Old Testament reading, as I said this evening, comes from Isaiah chapter 29, verses 11 to 19. And the description of the text says Isaiah's vision of God turning things upside down. God has a way of doing that every now and then. The vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, Read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far away from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people. And with wonder upon wonder... And the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord, your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, Who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should say to, of its maker, He did not make me. Or the thing formed say of him who formed him, he has no understanding of it. Is it not a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear, and the words of the book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy, and the Lord and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I said, our um, epistle reading is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Uh, this is the one that I often uh, mention to um, the women in the audience. In the congregation when I read this uh, try not to let your ears slam shut after the first verse or two um, because the whole thing actually plays out quite equally so let's go Paul writes wives 
Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might be present the church to him, present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets, but now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. And this is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter, um, verses 1 to 13, and in it we are going to see uh, the Pharisees argue with Jesus about traditions. When the Pharisees gathered to Jesus with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well, did, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. Then he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or mother, Whatever you would have gained from me is corbane, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, actually, it's praise to you, O Christ. So, um, Anyway, yeah, so those are the readings for this past Sunday. Um, Isaiah... You know, he's preaching to um, Israel as they're preparing to be crushed and taken into captivity. They've gotten warning after warning after warning. And as he says, uh, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. And this indeed is the prophecy that Jesus is talking about. Because what's happened here now, um, several hundred years after the captivity, after the Jews were released from Babylon and Persia and sent back to Jerusalem, they, they created all of these extra laws that were supposed to make um, worshiping God a more righteous thing. And I think I mentioned in the sermon on Sunday, I believe they were like 613 laws that went into great detail, and we'll talk about them more in that sermon. But it became that 
these statutes instituted by men became the only way to worship God. You had to abide by all of these statutes. If you didn't abide by them, um, then you, you, you weren't worthy or weren't worshiping God. And, and Jesus speaks in particular about how um, if someone declared their, themselves Corbain, uh, that's a word that we don't see or use anymore. Corbain meant that you were dedicating your life uh, and everything that you earned or made to the church. And, uh, and, and the problem with that was is according to the Ten Commandments, according to commandment number four, it is the, the, the child's responsibility to do what they can to help take care of the parent. And, but the, the scribes and Pharisees said, well, as long as you're giving all your stuff to us, then you don't need to worry about your parents, regardless of what God said. Don't worry about them. You give your stuff to us and, and you're good. You know, and, and that's not at all what, um, you know, what was intended by the commandments and, and the, the Pharisees and the scribes and those writers of these oral traditions um, really went over the deep end. And uh, in Isaiah, towards the end, he's just saying that he's going to make it right. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruit field and the fruit field is regarded as a forest? In that day, what? The deaf shall hear the words of the book and out of the gloom of the darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. Hey, he's talking about the coming of Jesus, you know. Um, the meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. Who's the Holy One of Israel? Jesus. So he's saying, you do what you do, but Jesus is coming, and, you know, look out. So anyway, um, that's about all I'm going to talk about with Isaiah. Ephesians, um, as I said, this is the one that sometimes is used at weddings. Um, I think partly the... Uh, both the bride and the groom have to feel comfortable with the relationship between themselves and God. Um, wives, submit to your own husbands. How do you submit to your husband? The same way you submit to the Lord. And here's where we talk about God's order of creation. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church's body and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit everything to their husbands. You know, what does the church offer to Christ? Everything. The church is Christ's body. You know, it's, it's an unbreakable relationship. And then, you know, here's the converse side to that. While the women have to submit to their husbands as the church submits to Christ, um, husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that means husbands are supposed to be willing to give themselves up for their wives. It's not a, a one-way street. As a matter of fact, it's two-way, 100% in both directions. Why? That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. He needs to recognize his wife that way. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. So husbands, you're supposed to cherish and love your wife and nourish her and raise her up just the way Christ does for the church. Why? Because we are all members of Christ's body, whether you're church. Yeah. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. It also recurs to husband and wife. Let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. It's a two-way street. So don't ever think that this is a one-way thing and that you need to, you know, as, as the wife, you need to submit to your husband. It, it's, a, it's a both or neither situation. You have to do that. So anyway, enough on that one. 
Um, as I said in the gospel reading, this is where the Pharisees are complaining because Jesus' disciples aren't washing their hands before they eat. And, and this isn't the kind of washing hands that we're talking about when you come in from work and outside. This is a ritual washing of hands, and I think I talk about that in this thing. Yeah, because we talk about the eggshells and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just going to read the sermon. Well, present. I don't try not to read. Um, done it a few times, so reading is not totally. But, uh, do I need the glasses? No. So anyway, um, I started the message with this, a, a story. A little story about a man who was sitting at home one evening. His wife was out. He was watching the news, and a, and a news alert came on and said that there was a vehicle driving the wrong way on the, on the interstate through town. And uh, the man knew that his wife would be coming home on that road, so he thought he'd better call her and warn her. So he calls her on the cell phone, and, and she answers and says hello. And he says, hey, honey, be careful. I just heard on the news that, that there's someone on the freeway going the wrong direction. And she says, someone? She said, they're all going the wrong direction. There's hundreds of them. This uh, story relates a principle that's not altogether uncommon. And the principle is that people, in spite of evidence to the contrary, um, believe that they're absolutely correct. We like to be right. <laughs> I know I like to be right. Uh, yeah, I've had some wonderful discussions with people, only to find out in the long run that maybe I wasn't quite as right as I thought I was. Never really wrong, though. But, um, you know, couldn't be that those other cars on the free, or that I was going the wrong way. It could only be that the other cars were going. Uh, it couldn't be me. So in, in this process of always wanting to be right, we lose focus on our sense of why we do what we do. It is more critical that we're deemed right than whether we are right. Uh, there's a story that I told of, of a man who fell ill. This is in ancient times. And it so happens that the place where he fell was exactly between two villages. And uh, it presented a problem because in, in the, these ancient times, according to the authorities, whoever, whichever village the, the injured or ill person was closest to had to take care of him. And, and that's where the disagreement uh, lay. He was right in between the two villages and the one village and dist said that the distance should be measured from the borderline of the city to the man's navel. Um, the other village argued that it should be calculated from the border of the city to the man's mouth. And they continued to argue over the jurisdiction and authority and who should take responsibility. And in the meantime, unfortunately, the poor fellow died. So the question is, do you suppose that the same kind of thing happens as people attempt to relate to God. Is it possible that our understanding of what is good and right and pleasing to the Lord can become uh, myopic? And myopic, uh, optical word myopic, or myopathy means uh, nearsighted. You know, so can we become nearsighted? Can we have that problem of, of uh, not being able to see the forest because of the trees? Is it possible that like that woman driving the wrong way on the freeway, people seeking to honor God can actually be traveling in the wrong direction? Is it possible that like the authorities of the two cities arguing about which was closest to the sick man, that people seeking to honor the Lord can be uh, majoring in the minors, as they say, while the soul are dying. You know, by majoring in the minors, uh, worrying about the little stuff, rather than worrying about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, you know, sometimes 
we forget what we're doing or who we're doing it for and it becomes about us. In the gospel lesson today, uh, Jesus was trying to tell the religious authorities of his day exactly that. Um, about 500 years before Jesus was born, uh, I, I say a group of people emerged, this was scribes and the Pharisees, and, and they were interested, very interested in upholding the letter of the law. They wanted to make it easier for people to follow God's commands. And, and it would have been fine had they truly honored what God had asked them to do. Um, but we heard in the Old Testament lesson, God wanted his people to fully obey him. That's what he wants. Obey me. But what these people, these scribes and Pharisees did, they, they insisted that the law be followed, but it had to be followed the way that they saw it. So they developed their own oral law. They developed exacting requirements. They exacted all these rules and rituals. And they demanded that everybody live by those requirements. There were over 613 of those requirements. They call it oral history, but it's written down. And anybody who didn't follow all of those rites and rituals and rules, they said, well, you simply aren't honoring God. Because if you want to honor God, you have to do what we tell you to do and exactly how we tell you to do it. And the hand washing is the example that, that, that came up, that they brought forth. And, and here's what it was. It was kind of unique. It says, for the hand washing law went something like this. Before you could eat, and we didn't have measuring cups back then, so what they did is you had to take one and a half hand shell eggshells of water and you had to pour it over your hands and it couldn't be just in any manner. The first time it had to be done with your hands held fingertips forward and you pour the water over your hands or somebody would pour the water over your hands. One and a half eggshells and it ran down to your wrist and then what you would do you would take the fist of one hand and rub the palm of the other hand like that and then once you were done with that, you'd put your hands back together and you'd turn them upside down. And then you'd pour another one and a half eggshells of water on them from wrist to fingertips. So it wasn't a matter of hygiene. It was a matter of ritual. It had to be done even if your hands were spotless. If you had just gotten out of the bathtub or out of the shower, and it was time to eat, you would still have to do this to your hands. Because they said that in order to please God, you had to do this. And to f the failure to do it, to not do it exactly that way, was a sin. You know, it kind of reminds me of some of the audiophora that we encounter sometimes in the church. I know there's been many discussions over the years uh, for acolytes. What is the proper way to light and extinguish the candles during worship? You know, do you go from the outside in and then the inside out? Um, do the altar candles get lit before or after? Do they get put out before or after? The, you know, all of that. And I know people that have had arguments and discussions and people have become very upset because it's not being done the way that they learned. And guess what? If we uh, pull out our Bible, no, oh, mine's in the other room. If we pull out our Bible and we look up uh, candle lighting, we're not going to find it. It's audiophora. Scripture doesn't say. The thing we run into then is tradition. And sometimes, I, had, I heard this in seminary, sometimes tradition is harder to change than doctrine, even though it may be wrong. So, so when the Pharisees and the scribes, anyway, as we continue, saw Jesus' disciples not washing their hands before they sat down to eat, they went a little crazy. And they even accused Jesus. And, and basically their accusation was 
if you're not teaching your disciples to honor God like our ancestors did, then you must not be from God either. It was another way of them to try and disavow who Jesus was. And Jesus told them, he quoted the very scripture from Isaiah that, that we read today. He said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites in the scripture. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is pointless because their teachings are rules made by humans. Now let's put that in a modern context. You see, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were, were, were driving the wrong way down the freeway. And they thought Jesus and the disciples were wrong. They were worried about the minutia. They were worried about crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And all along, while they were worried about that, people were perishing around them. In short, they spent their time majoring in the minors and forcing their people to do the same. And the real tragedy is that they did this all in the name of serving the living God. But it was a complete perversion of God's law. My friends, maybe those same scribes and Pharisees are no longer alive but I can tell you that their spirit lives on to this very day. You see, whenever we take a matter of grace or a matter of preference and turn it into a requirement for the kingdom, then we too honor God only with our lips. When our worship becomes a matter of law rather than a matter of grace, we honor God only with our lips. And the real tragedy of living a life of bondage to man-made rules and requirements is that Christ came to shed his blood and died in order to purchase freedom for us. Jesus told his followers up front, he said, Indeed, the time is coming, and it is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is looking for people like that to worship him. God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. You can go to John 4, 23 to 24 and find that right there. You see, the worship of God is not about rules and regulations. It's not exclusively about liturgies and hymns. It's not about how well we memorize scripture verses or whether we've taken a, a two-year rather than a two-week confirmation class. The thing we have to remember when it comes to our worship, when it comes to our sharing God's message with those around us, when we're trying to do God's good work in the kingdom, it's not about us and if we think it's about us then we kind of become like those scribes and Pharisees we need to make sure that it's about the mission it's about what we are to be about you know I, I was thinking of this afterwards and I was going to use this story yesterday and I forgot about it when I was in the Air Force, you know, when you're in the service, everything is about mission. You know, it's all about the mission. And I was stationed up in Duluth. I don't know how many of you know this, but back in the day, Duluth was the headquarters of the 23rd Air Division of the North American Air Defense Command, NORAD. And uh, their headquarters was in Duluth. It was in what was called the Sage Building. It's a giant block building that's now part of the university. And I remember the first time I took a tour of that building, I worked in the fire department and we had to go through and learn the building and find out all about it. And some of the things about the building amazed me. And one of them was that on the third floor of that building, the entire third floor was two identical massive computers. 
Now the building was built in 1954 and 55, so you understand these are early old computers. Even into the 70s when I was there, they still weren't, you know, by any means top of the line computers. They were still vacuum tubes in a lot of places. And they had two computers side by side. One was running all the time, one was on standby, and those computers ran and oversaw the air defense of the entire United States from the western border of North Dakota to the western border of New York all the way up to the North Pole. Anything that came into that airspace had to be identified in a matter of minutes and they used things like the dew line and we had fighter bases all over Canada and the northern tier of the United States and they would scramble jets anytime anything unidentified was in those sectors and all of that ran through that big computer on the third floor. Well we found out something interesting on the fourth floor is where the command center was and it looks like just some of the ones you see in the movie with all the big desks and the big screen and all of that going on and there was always a command level officer on duty. That means you had to be a full bird colonel or higher. Duluth had a much higher than proportional ratio of uh, full bird colonels and generals because there always had to be a colonel or a general sitting in that chair. <coughs> and because it was a joint base between us and Canada, they were either American or sometimes Canadian. Um, but anyway, the computer had on various locations all along the computer in both sides of the building it had a dead man button where if somebody fell into the computer or was working on the computer and began to be electrocuted um, whoever was with them could hit the button to shut down the computer and one of the things they told us we had to remember was that when you push that button to shut down the computer, it wasn't instantaneous. Because what happened is that button sent a signal to the chair. There was another button on the chair of the commanding officer. And what that button on his chair was, was an override button. If the general needed the computer, if he was in an air defense situation, if he needed to fulfill the mission, he could hit that button and override the dead man switch. Because the mission was more important than the man. Not always a comforting thought if you're an electrician working on the computer. Fortunately, it was never used, or at least the override was never used. But, and now it's all gone. It's all been replaced by an airplane. <coughs> but that's what I mean about mission. My friends, we have a mission. We have a mission to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with everybody. And we have to remember the mission isn't about us. Kind of like the poor electrician that fell into the computer when the dead man switch was hit. If the mission was going on, he was expendable. Now hopefully we don't ever have to worry about being expendable, but if we are, we get to spend the eternity in heaven as long as we're working on the mission, right? Um, but anyway, honoring God is about meeting him on his terms. Our, our worship is not about coming together to do something for God. When we come to the church on Sunday, when you listen to me on Wednesday night, we're not coming to do something from God. We are coming to receive from God. We receive his forgiveness. To trade our bloody guilt, our sinful nation, nature with the perfect holy righteousness that Jesus won for us on the cross. Indeed, the, the great clarion call of the church, I, and I messed this up week before last at, at Our Lady, or, or not Our Lady, Holy Mackerel, not Our Lady, at, at uh, Little Girl's Point. Um, sola Gratia, Sola Fide, Sola Christos. The three solas of Martin Luther. Sola Gratia, Grace Alone, Sola Fide, Faith Alone, Sola Christos, Christ Alone. Only by grace, through faith, in Christ, 
are we saved? There's nothing we can do. It's not about us. It's about him. Jesus has set us free from the burdens of the law. He's done it all and has left nothing undone for us to do to receive the Father's full forgiveness. He, he has taken care of all the minutia. He's crossed the T's. He's dotted the I's. It is done. What did he say on the cross? It is finished. And he finished it for us. So we always need to remember it's not about us. It's about Christ and our mission to serve Christ. So tonight I ask that God grant you the perfect peace, that perfect peace that comes with forgiveness and the freedom that Jesus purchased for you through his life, death, and resurrection so that we can fulfill his mission and in the end, be with him forever in eternity. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, I hope that, I hope that worked. I hope the sound worked better. Um, and like I say, I'm sorry about Sunday. It was completely my fault. I forgot to turn on two of the switches. And now, fortunately, June and two other people know where all those switches are. So hopefully that won't be an issue anymore. Um, <coughs> and if you have any questions, thoughts, comments, let me know. I'd be happy to hear them. So uh, we'll continue with prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our well-being, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Matthew, our synodical president, Dwayne, our district president, for all pastors in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, for all public servants, for the, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in the congregation, those who toil, those who sing, all those people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, and danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those with special concerns and needs to stay, those who are ill or in the hospital, including Colton, Haley, Danny, Sherry, Judith, Walt, Rosemary, Harold, Sally, Lisa, Russell, Carmela, and Tyler. We also include all those who grieve. We pray for those who are unemployed or underemployed, the chronically ill, the shut-in, and all the others whose needs are not known to us at this time. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. I forgot one up here. For President Biden, for all public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Alleluia. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. To you, O Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness 
through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. My friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and to give you peace. Amen. Once again, thank you so much for joining me this evening. I, I hope you enjoyed it. As always, if you have any questions, thoughts, comments, please let me know. You know how to do it. Um, there's a hundred different ways to get a hold of me. Well, probably not a hundred, but you know there's a lot of ways. And I always enjoy a visit, so feel free to stop by if you so desire. Um, like I say, I look I look forward to seeing you again next week. Hopefully I'll see you in church on Sunday. Um, if not, we'll be back here Wednesday night next week, same time, same stations. And uh, in the meantime, uh, be happy, be healthy, be kind, be safe, be uh, faithful, be loving, be caring, be generous. And especially, be ever watchful for the return of our Lord. For as Steve says, he's coming soon. And I believe him. Look at the world today. Amen. Good night. And God bless.